About five years ago, I went to a talk that changed my life. The presentation was at a foreign policy think tank, and the speaker there was a U.S. government intelligence official who shared a just declassified top secret report. The report said the world was going into a period of water scarcity that had already begun and which would accelerate until a crisis was felt around the world sometime around the year 2025. Sixty percent of the world's landmass would be affected, as would more than one billion people directly and billions more indirectly. It would result in higher food prices, instability in many places, the failure of some countries important to the United States, and the report concluded could even result in the U.S. having to rethink its global defense architecture. Well, as you would imagine, a main culprit of this was, of course, climate change, but it wasn't the only element. We are 7 billion people in the world today, projected to rise to more than 10 billion people in the coming decades. And if we are already pinched for water to grow our food, where will we find the water to grow the food for these new billions? And a rising standard of living would also play a part in this, because the diet that people like you and I enjoy is a diet likely to have animal protein in it, whereas poor people get by on wheat, corn, and rice. And to cite just one statistic, it takes 17 times more water to raise a pound of beef than it does to grow a pound of corn. So to accommodate what is projected now as more than one billion people rising to the middle class over the next 10 years will require an enormous amount of new water. So I left this meeting concerned. And maybe like you, you go to a meeting, you hear something, you think this is really important, and then the next day it just evaporates, it disappears. But not for me. I went back to my office that very day, I went online, I started reading, and I kept reading the next day, the next week, the next month. But as I read, I kept bumping into something that I found surprising. It seemed that nearly every solution to water scarcity had either been invented in Israel or was one in which Israel had played a leading part. And I found this puzzling because I thought I knew something about Israel, and it didn't fit what I thought I knew. For example, Israel is in the driest region in the world. It only rains in Israel from October or November to March or April, and nearly two-thirds of the country is desert, and only one-third is semi-arid. And therefore, there's not a lot of water there. It also struck me that uh, there was other parts of this that didn't make any sense. Remember I had said to you that the intelligence official in talking to us said that climate change, population growth, and a rising standard of living were the major culprits in this, in this uh, problem of water scarcity. Well, Israel has suffered terribly from climate change. In the last few decades, Israel's average annual rainfall has diminished by nearly 25%. And as for population, as you see here, since achieving independence in 1948, Israel has had the fastest rate of population rise of any country in the world, an 11-fold increase in population during that time. And as for affluence, well, after Singapore and South Korea, no other country has enjoyed the kind of economic growth as has Israel in that same time period. Yet, instead of Israel just getting by on meager water resources, as you would expect, remarkably, Israel was water abundant. How abundant? An example or two. Israel provides its entire population 24-7, healthy, safe, on-demand water. Now, that may be something you can take for granted in London or New York, but it's actually something that's only enjoyed by a relatively small minority of the world's population. Also, moreover, agriculture, as we know, is a large consumer of water, and yet, even so, Israel is self-sufficient 
and fruits and vegetables and even exports billions of dollars a year of produce, which is akin to exporting billions and billions of gallons of precious water every year. And on top of that, Israel provides the Palestinian Authority with the majority of the water consumed by Palestinians in the West Bank and provides the Kingdom of Jordan with a lot of water. Israel also sends water to Gaza every day, even during times of conflict. How, I ask myself, how was this possible? And if the world really is going into a period of water scarcity, I thought it will be important for the world to have a model to learn from, to copy. And so on the theory that there is a book on every subject, I went looking for a book on Israel's water triumph, but I couldn't find one. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll find a book in Hebrew and we'll figure out a way and get it translated. But there was no book in Hebrew either. And then it hit me. What if I wrote the book? And so I did. I spent 14 months doing research, nine months writing and rewriting, and I'll be honest with you, I got lucky. I found a great publisher, and the book called Let There Be Water struck a nerve, and within weeks of its release, it became a national bestseller in the United States, making it onto the New York Times, LA Times, and Washington Post bestseller lists. It's Israel's story. I just told it. There are 15 international editions that are now either out or soon to be out, covering nearly 50 countries around the world. And you know what we learned from this? There's clearly a lot of interest in water scarcity and what to do about it. So what do we do about it? What did Israel do about it? And what is it that the world can learn from the Israeli example? Okay, first, even before there was a state, Israel's pre-state leaders developed a culture and an ethos that would not allow water scarcity to slow their ability to grow and prosper. No less than Israel's renowned military capability and its sophisticated immigration absorption system, Israel's leaders put money and some of the best minds to work on the water future of the young country. And you know, it's just like in our lives. When you really focus on something, sometimes you get a really good result, and that's exactly what happened here. Second, unlike in most of the world where water is highly politicized, Israel has an apolitical, technocratic form of water governance called the Israel Water Authority. The organization focuses on the best use of water for the largest number of people possible, and they plan far, far into the future. Third, in most of the world, the price of water is subsidized. Few actually pay the real price for their water. But market forces work well in encouraging conservation, efficiency, and innovation. In Israel, the government does not provide any subsidy of water whatsoever. Whether it's for infrastructure or administration or pumping water to people's homes, the Israeli public pays the complete and full price for all of the water used. And because they pay for their full price of water, losing water is like losing money. This has led to Israel developing among the finest national water infrastructure systems in the world, losing relatively small amounts of water to leaks. And finally, technology. Israel is well known as a global center of problem solving and innovation. And if this is true, and it is, if this is true, in high tech and in cybersecurity, it's also true in water tech innovation and across the spectrum of that category from infrastructure planning to leak minimization to, to security to irrigation to agriculture. And since agriculture uses the largest part of water nearly everywhere, using from half to 95% of a country's freshwater reserves, maximizing every drop that falls 
on farm or field is especially important. Fittingly, it was in Israel that drip irrigation was invented. In most of the world, fields are irrigated by either flooding them or by using sprinklers. In either case, this results in large amounts of water being lost to evaporation, sometimes as much as 80% of the total water. But with drip irrigation, tiny drippers feed droplets of water to the plants at their roots, and almost nothing is lost to evaporation. In total, this saves enormous, enormous amounts of water. Israel also is a global center of seed innovation. Israeli scientists use non-GMO devices to develop drought-resistant seeds that allow plants to grow on poor quality water. What that means is that water that would have no other use can be used to grow certain crops, saving quality water for better uses. In addition, because it always takes a lot of water to grow any kind of crop or any kind of plant, Israeli seed scientists have focused on what is harvested. What I mean by that is they use traditional breeding to develop tomato plants with very short roots and almost no leaves. They developed wheat plant with a very short stalk. Why waste water on a part of the plant that you can't eat and you can't use? And that's not all Israeli technologists did. In 1951, when the country was, to be honest, broke and focused mostly on security and absorbing immigrants, Israel's leaders looked far into the future and decided to pursue a new source of water. They decided to capture nearly all of the sewage in the country, to treat it to an ultra-high pure level, but to use none of it for drinking water. Instead, to use it all for agriculture. They spent 30 years and billions of dollars building a parallel national water infrastructure system. And now, special pipes are used to take this treated water to farms all over the country where that water is used to grow appropriate crops. Israel today leads the world in the reuse of treated sewage. Treating and reusing nearly 90% of the country's sewage. And I want to tell you something. If right now the reuse of water is in its infancy all over the world, or nearly all over the world, I want to promise you something, that in a very short time, it will be common that everyone, or nearly everyone, will be using recycled water for an ever drier world, and with Israel as the inspiration for this. In the 1950s, Israel's leaders began talking about making the desert bloom. Now, in part, that would be achieved by taking this treated wastewater and using it there. But in their dreams, they thought they would achieve the greening of the desert by what they then called desalting the sea, which was the idea that became desalination. Today, the equivalent of 80% of the household water consumed in Israel comes from one of Israel's Mediterranean desalination plants. And this plant is the largest, most energy efficient, most water productive desalination plant in the entire world located in Israel. In my book, I talk about how Israel's culture, governance, an embrace of technology led to its water independence. But that's not all I talk about. I also talk about what I call hydro diplomacy and how water and water technology can be used to open doors and help build relationships. And it was in large part because of China's fascination with Israeli advances in water technology that China made a decision to abandon its support for the Arab boycott of Israel to reach out to Israel and ask Israel to send to China a leading Israeli hydrologist. They did. 
in less than one year from his arrival, the two countries decided to establish diplomatic relations. Now, that story can be told again and again with one country after another, with water as the medium, including as recently as this very year, when several water-poor African nations made the decision to make ties with Israel. We all know that water can be a source of conflict. But what the Israel case represents is that water can also be a source of conflict resolution. Water can open a pathway to coexistence, to cooperation, and maybe, maybe even to peace. Civilization was transformed when humankind learned how to grow food. No longer needing to be nomads foraging for food, people could stay rooted in a single place and grow all the food they could need. Similarly, where once people had to go to where the water is, now everyone can develop all the water they can need. In Israel, nearly two-thirds of the water used by homes, offices, businesses of all kind, and even agriculture comes from developed sources. Only one-third of Israel's water comes from such natural sources as a river, a lake, or an aquifer. And if Israel had to do so, it actually could develop all of the water it needs to. As with the rise of agriculture, civilization can be transformed with this new technology, with humankind less dependent than ever on the whims of nature. But, but there is another possibility, a dark and scary prospect. It is also possible that we are on the cusp of a dimension of humanitarian disaster unknown since World War II or maybe ever in recorded history. There are hundreds of millions of people, I want to repeat that, there are hundreds of millions of people who live in places where the water is at risk of running out. And if we don't do something quickly to address this inadequacy of supply, get ready for waves and waves of water refugees, people forced to leave where they live to seek out new places where they can find water to live their lives. These people live in very famous places like India, but also they live in lots of places that don't seem to get covered much on the nightly news. Places, countries in Africa and Asia and South America. But here's what you need to know. Whether a rich country or a poor country, a large country or a small country, a landlocked country or a country with a long sea coast, every country has something to learn from the Israel experience with water. The world doesn't have to invent a new approach. Everybody has something to learn from how Israel became water abundant and drought proof. There are no secrets. This is available to everyone everywhere. And you know, in an ever drier, more water scarce world, in a world where growing food will become more difficult but yet more necessary for the billions of people on their way, it's actually comforting to know that there's a model that works, a model that the world can look to to avoid the worst of this coming water scarcity. But we have to get going. Delay could lead to catastrophe, but as we see from Israel, a secure, even water-abundant future is possible. Thank you.